Hello and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast with your host, metaphysician, Reiki master, and hypnotherapist, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week, we will discover teachings, tips, and tools to radiate your best life ever with practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Hello and welcome back to the Radiate Wellness Podcast, where today we radiate connection with the universe with Dr. Frederick Woodard, who is the author of the new book, Developing Your Supernatural Awareness, Connecting with an Interactive Universe. Now, Dr. Woodard is a clinical psychologist and certified hypnotherapist who conducts original research on the supernatural paranormal, hypnosis, and psychotherapy. His research stems from his dissatisfaction with general psychological explanations of hypnosis and altered states, which have not reflected his own personal and clinical experience. Yeah, you know, as a hypnotherapist myself or hypnotist myself, I totally agree with that. So welcome, Dr. Woodard. Thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. We've been having some scheduling difficulties and lots of technical difficulties. So fingers crossed that this is going to work for the entire interview. So I just have to say, I think this work is very important, looking into our connection with the universe and what the supernatural is and the paranormal and how that interacts with our daily life. So why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I had an interest in things that were new and different and not written a lot about, not understood completely. So I wanted to write about something that was different. My book is about that. And even the little connections I had were things that kind of led me toward a better understanding of these experiences. Now, you've had some experiences yourself. Little ones, yes. Can you share some? Well, for one, I I remember once when I was an undergrad in college, I was going through a convenience store for a soda. And I was thinking about my uncle who died in the war. And I was thinking, oh, maybe that's all just made up garbage. It's not real stuff. And I bought the soda. And in my change was a World War II nickel, which is really impossible to get. Yeah, and um, rare. Right, very rare. So I said to myself at that moment, maybe I need to close my mind and just be open to what takes place and not make a judgment on this. And it was because of the World War II nickel, which was connected to war, which was connected to my uncle in that way. So I also had an experience when I was at the State Library in Concord, New Hampshire, doing genealogy. And I was trying to find one of my great, 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 great grandfathers and his son, who was a captain in the Revolutionary War. I couldn't make a connection. And so I was about to give up. And there was these three old men sitting in the corner talking, and they were mumbling. You couldn't really hear what they were saying. And suddenly one of the guy's voices in my head said as loud as could be inside my head, check the land deeds. And so I went and I ordered the land deeds at the Mormon church in Nashua. And I got a document that like said the relationship between my grandmother, Mary Woodard, who was widowed because Joshua was murdered and her son saying that that was his mother. Now, I have to ask these men who are at the library, were they alive? (laughs) Were they real? Yeah, they were real. They were real. They were real people. Oh, wow. So I think that I have this theory on the old Greeks and Romans way back in time, way back in time, used to say, never mistreat any person because you never know when you're talking to a god or a goddess. And I don't think they literally mean that that person is a god or a goddess, but that through those people, can come messages that are really powerful. And I think that's what happened. Something, someone, some being decided I needed to know what to do and guided me. Yeah, yeah. So these paranormal experiences kind of opened you up to the spiritual world? Yes. There's so many roads to get to the spiritual world and dissect or deconstruct paranormal experiences. Why did you go the psychotherapy route? Well, because I wanted to be able to work on stuff. And I wanted to also get an education where I could learn something about how to interview people and really do it in a good way. 
And so I learned phenomenology and humanistic psychology at University of West Georgia, which is part in Carrollton, Georgia. And then from Fresno at California School of Professional Psychology, I studied phenomenology. And I also had some experience with Emilio Giorgi, who was teaching out of uh, San Francisco at the time. He gave some feedback to my work. So I learned a way to interview people and keep my own stuff to myself. That is actually quite brilliant, I have to say. That's a wonderful way to approach it. But it was time-consuming and costly in that I had to go get an education and all that. Well, of course, it also gave you the credentials to talk to people about their experiences, too. Yes. I've had a lot of people tell me that this is the first person I ever told this experience to. Yeah, I get that a lot, too. So you interviewed many people for this book, right? Developing Your Supernatural Awareness. Yeah. How did you find these research subjects? I put an ad in the local papers, and it was explaining what I was doing, that I needed to ask them a question, and if they had the real experience to give me a call. So I did it. I wrote it up properly. So you were looking for people who had paranormal experiences? Yes. But that was after I'd had people tell me experiences in my office. People just randomly told me, you seem like an open guy. I want to tell you something. And then they tell me their experience. And so that kind of led me to want to do more. Oh, that is amazing. So as this work developed, like what kind of themes were you noticing? So themes I noticed were out of the blue. The first thought that comes to your mind, and that means it's not connected to thoughts before. It's totally different. It would be an out, it would be something that breaks through your experiencing whatever you're experiencing. It's not that, it's something else. So what helped you with the research for developing your supernatural awareness, connecting with an interactive universe, as far as methodology and technique? Phenomenology and humanistic interviewing. I can, you know, kind of maybe into it what phenomenology is, but can you speak to what that field of study is all about? It's very difficult because it's very time consuming and most people don't want to do it. You interview the person a number of times until they don't tell you anything new. And then you reorganize all the material so it's all organized. So you take the several interviews and flop them together, you know, and you put it in in its order. And then you add any meaning that you see. For example, I had one time somebody that I think they were driving alone in their car and there was nobody else in the car. But they didn't say that pretty much. They just said they were in their car. I asked a couple of questions about, was there anyone else in the car? No, I was by myself. So then that kind of things like that are really important sometimes. Was there someone else there? Were you by yourself? Oh, absolutely. Right. But most of the questions I ask are very basic. Just you said, can you say more about that? I may have asked that question that way too. You were driving in your car. Can you say more about that? And then they said, well, I was alone in my car. Yeah. Important distinction. So you say the universe is alive with invisible beings. Who are what are they? How do you define that? I don't want to take too much of your time, but I would like to ask you a few simple favors. First of all, please rate, review, and share this podcast wherever you're listening. You know, it sounds like a simple little thing, and it is. But it has a huge impact for us because it helps other people find us in the podcasting algorithms. I don't know how it works, but I do know that it helps a lot. Next, if you would subscribe or follow wherever you're listening, whether that's YouTube or Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you're listening, just hit subscribe or follow and that helps you and it helps us. It helps you because then you receive notifications when we have a new episode that's out. It helps us because, again, algorithm, magic, I don't know what happens, but it helps. And then finally, you can support our podcast in a tangible way by going to radiatewellnesscommunity.com slash podcast and then click on support the show. Now, we have a new feature, too. We are now on Patreon. You can find us on Patreon. You can also find the link to Patreon when you go to radiatewellnesscommunity.com slash podcast. 
So on Patreon, for $3 a month or $5 a month, you can support your metaphysical and spiritual growth. You can learn about upcoming guests, and you can get early and ad-free versions of the shows. So please support us. This podcast is free for you to listen, but we have costs, and quite frankly, they come out of my pocket. So if you like this content, if you get a lot out of it, please see what you can do to give back. Thank you so much. So many different individuals taught me stuff. One person talked about how their great-grandmother, their great-uncle, and they'd sense them before they saw them, and they'd feel them. And then when they went in their house and they had passed, they sensed them, they felt them, and then they knew it was them through the feeling, the feeling alone. So what is it, because I feel people as well, but angels and all kinds of entities, but what is it that we are feeling in that moment? I'm not sure. We're feeling them. You're feeling them. You're feeling the vibration of them or something about them. That's all I know. I'm not an expert in like all the details and I wouldn't want to be in all the details of the physical aspects of all that or whatever that is. But I sense that people are picking up what they need to. What they need to. That's interesting. Just enough to confirm the experience? To confirm whatever they need to confirm for themselves. Right, right. When you were talking about feeling someone, I have friends that I am so connected with that I actually feel their feelings. I feel what they're going through, even if they're thousands of miles away. But you know, when you feel it, who that is, each individual person is. So, I mean, we could sit here and talk all day about what is that exactly? How do we know? But I agree with you. Suffice to say that when you know it, you know it. Right. So what are the two factors that help you determine that a supernatural event took place? Well, the two I use most of the time is the idea that somebody has an internal experience of something and then it really happens. And then the other thing is that when a person has an experience, it transforms them. It changes them in a very big way, not in a little way. Like they become much more spiritual, much more real, much more connected. Right. How do you find much more connected? It's not a definition. It's like an idea. It's the idea that I think I said earlier that I worked with this woman. She was very old. She was in her late 70s. And she told me a story about how when she was young in her 20s, she went to go to the laundromat. And when she went to go to the laundromat, she asked her husband to go with her. And he wouldn't go because he had things to do. And so she went by herself and she looked in the laundromat and said, oh, good. There's a guy in there. I'll be safe. And that wasn't the case. He hurt her bad. He knocked her out cold and he raped her. And while she was passed out, she went to the light and had a conversation with someone she knew at the time, but she can't remember who that is. And when she was there, she said, I just want to bring my children with me. And the person said, no, you can't. And furthermore, if you come through now, you're going to have to relive your whole life over again. And she said, well, I don't want to do that. And then realizing she would lose her children, she came back and had no desire to die. That's a little example. I don't think I'd want to come back either and have to do everything over again up to that point. No, thank you. So statistics have shown that more and more people believe in the afterlife as ever-emerging evidence and information have proven that the body dies, but the spirit does live on. As we discover and uncover more about things, do you think we're moving into a new era of acceptance along with less fear in these subjects? Possibly. It depends on who you talk to. It does seem like there is some sort of spiritual renaissance, spiritual awakening. What do you think is going on there? I'm not sure. I just kind of work with the people I've worked that come into my life and kind of deal with that. So it's more like an individual thing. You know, I was blessed enough to be able to interview Dr. Raymond Moody, who is the one who coined the phrase near-death experience and who did so much research over the decades of his career. And he was of the same mind. I asked him how this works, what goes on when we die. He says, you know, I don't know. And I think that skepticism, that step back is a good place to Well, it's not skepticism necessarily. It's just not knowing, having the answers. You can't really say. You don't know for sure all the details about something greater than us, something that may be beyond our even understanding completely as people. But when we leave our body, then maybe we'll understand better. 
So more of an agnosticism, really, not knowing. Not being able to understand completely what's happening, but being able to understand that some things are wonderful and some things are really good and some things aren't. Are you finding in your practice that more people are getting on board with these concepts? Some people are. Some people are. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I think it might be just the not research and the knowledge we've done and the fact that we have books out and people listen to people and there's podcasts like yours and other people's that kind of reach out to people. So just more of this topic being out there to discuss. Yeah. Mm -hmm, I can see that. Yeah. Now you had some key findings that are the common thread of the supernatural experience. Can you talk about that? The key findings were, what do you mean by that? So in your materials that I have in front of me, it talks about 12 key findings that are the common thread of the supernatural experience that individuals are reporting on a historical level. That's not ringing a bell? Well, I wrote them down, but I worked on the material from an intellectual perspective with the book and kind of wrote what was going down in the book. But it's like you got to read the book to kind of get the ideas. Understand the 12 key findings. There are 12 common experiences that happen within a lot of experiences. They're not every single one experience has them, but they're very common among many experiences. Okay, so what is common among these experiences? That it can happen anywhere, that it can happen to anyone of any age, for example, that people are fearful that they're going to be called crazy, things like that. My work is clearly based on the people I spoke with. So in talking to the people that you spoke with, what makes someone more susceptible to having these experiences? I'm not sure. It could be an openness to things. That could very well be part of it. I don't know. So are you finding any commonalities between these people that are having these experiences? I didn't study the people. I studied their experience. Um, And I tried to share in my book the details of those experiences so that people could gain that knowledge for themselves. Right, right. Is it comforting or validating for people who've had supernatural experiences to finally be able to talk freely and share with others about it? Yes. What I find is the people that I spoke with wanted to find other people that had similar experiences, or they're people that didn't have an experience and wanted to have an experience. Right. Yeah, there are people who really are very eager to have these kind of experiences, but for for whatever reason, they never do. But yeah, I can see where you would want to talk to somebody about it. If you've had this insane experience, perhaps fearful of judgment or critique, you might want to talk with somebody who doesn't think that you're crazy. Someone who would understand what that experience is like. Sometimes we need to speak it into existence in a way to just validate to ourselves and and have another share in that experience. And that, that would be tremendously healing. Do you provide any type of support for folks who are wanting to discuss their experiences? Yes. What type of support? Generally, I'm just supportive during what the time I spend with them. Right. Because you can share your experiences too. Well, I don't really share. I don't have a lot of experiences that are really big experiences. I don't have insight into everybody's stuff. My experiences were little ones. In your book, what do you think is the biggest type of experience that someone has had? They're all relevant and they're all important, the ones that I identified, because there's all these different people. And I remember one guy that I interviewed, he was a person that believed he could go into a crowd and take people's energy. And he could take people's energy because they didn't protect themselves. And that was their fault. Oh, my. So what came of that? Nothing. I told him, he said, you're going to tell me that's wrong. But I put it under an ethical section where I had acting responsibly, ethically, responsibly with your gifts. I teach people to connect with their gifts and work with them. So I have my own ethical rules that I like to teach. What are your ethical rules? To do no harm. Anything else? Basically the same boundaries, things like that. I haven't written them down or identified them as I just try to live a decent life and treat people well. Well, that's the basics of ethics, isn't it? Now, I, I teach people that 
just because you have a key to someone's house doesn't mean that you use it to go in their house if you've not been invited, if they've not asked you to go and check on their plants or their cats. We just don't do that. So not looking into other people's stuff without their knowledge or consent. That to me, that is huge. That we shouldn't just walk up to some, unless there are very, very few. I would never even imagine doing something like that. Right. Now, nor do I. I don't do that. But there are times when spirit is tapping me so hard on the shoulder and practically knocking my knees out from under me, saying, you've got to tell this person now. But those are so rare, right? Right. Otherwise, no, it's none of my business. No one has asked me. No one has given their permission. So that is off limits. Okay. So that's the thing. Yeah, that's always respecting people, respecting who people are and not trying to manipulate them and get them to do what you want them to do is another big one. Absolutely. Also in this section on protecting your supernatural awareness, you talk about dealing with skeptics. Can you give us some tips on how to deal with skeptics? Well, I talk briefly about it and I just kind of mention how skeptics are people that haven't had experiences, so they have nothing to relate it to. And therefore, they can't open up to it. And they're not open enough to do that. So that's why they're skeptics. Just because they haven't had the experience yet. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. So someone who's not had an experience, I'm coming forward and I'm talking about my experience. And so how can we deal with these people who say, yeah, I don't believe it? Well, it's not so much dealing with people that say they don't believe it. People can believe anything they want. They have that right. But it's more about people that are actively attacking something that you want to kind of not take that stuff seriously, because you know otherwise through your experiences that things can be different than what people think they are. Exactly. Right. Right. I don't know that I need to have anyone believe me when I talk about these paranormal and supernatural experiences, but at least to accept it and be open enough to say, okay, You believe that happened to you, and I respect that. Right. That's the whole key is letting people have their experiences. I remember an old show. It was a very old show. She was very famous, Shella Belafonte or something. And a guy, I can't even remember the name of it now, but it was a paranormal weekly show at night. And they were two professors who worked out of their office. They taught it and they researched it. It was very interesting because they would talk about different stuff that mattered like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it does matter. There's a whole universe that we're not privy to on a daily basis. And it permeates us, though, and it's around us constantly. So I think it's good to know what it's about and how it affects us and how we interact with it. So what positive experiences or aspects to awareness have you gained from writing this book? I think being more open about things and realizing there's a lot more to the world and the universe than I even realize. That is so important. Are you continuing with the hypnotherapy now? I mean, are you continuing your research after writing this book? I'm continuing to do the work. Yeah. So what do you discover during hypnosis with these clients? I'm not doing more research. The research is all in my book. My perceptual hypnosis book has that information on it, on the phenomenological aspect. There was a guy, Donald Snag, in the 1940s, him and Arthur Combs, they wrote these books. And in it, he said that the best way to understand hypnosis would be through phenomenology. But he didn't really do the work. He just used like one or two minor examples. I, 50 something years later, chose to do the work. And I learned that through one of their students, Ann Cohen Richards, who taught me at the University of West Georgia. I wrote a paper and she said, you should publish this. So I submitted it to a journal and the journal was very behavioral and they trashed it and said, no, this is no good. And so I took it to her and I said, no, I guess I'm not a good writer. This isn't any good. And she said, let me see. And she looked at it and she said, this is political. Send it to a different journal. And I sent it to another journal and they accepted it. And when they accepted it, the author, who the leader of the other journal tried to like attack on it. And they wrote a letter that they CC'd to me saying, first, you need to recognize there was three leaders in the field that said this was a contribution to the field. And you need to acknowledge that 
before you go any further. Is that what that one person described as political? Yeah, it was political in the sense of my way is more valuable than your way. And, you know, sometimes people do things like that, where I think the great teachers I've had, the great leaders I've learned, they use everything. And I had one professor in Georgia that talked about how behavioral, dynamic, and spiritual are all different dimensions of the same thing. And when they're working together, they tell the truth. And when they're in conflict, somebody's wrong. See, oh, that makes so much sense. I like that. As multidimensional beings, we would want all of our dimensions to be coherent and cohesive. Right. And so <laughs> I try to focus on the positive, positive aspects of all that stuff. Right. So are you finding people who are having a difficult time with their multidimensionality, they're a difficult time with their paranormal or supernatural experiences. Some people do. Why is that? I don't know. I don't have answers for a lot of things. I don't want to say one thing. There's too many different possibilities. Every person's unique. Every person's an individual. Mm -hmm. Not true, true. So what might cause someone to have a difficult time processing their spiritual or supernatural experiences? Maybe their background and their growing up and the family that were around them weren't open to those things. Maybe they had beliefs that contradicted those things, and letting go of those beliefs is very difficult. Yeah, it could be religious programming, community standards. So when do you help people just to come to terms with their supernatural experiences? When they want that, yes, I would. Right. So if somebody's having a difficult time accepting their supernatural experiences, where would you even begin with that? What would you tell them? Oh, well, I don't work that way. It's like the person has to open up what matters to them. And then I go from there. So I kind of work with the person's experience and where they're coming from and help them grow wherever they need to. So it's very individual. Again, I couldn't say that it would, there's one way or there's certain aspects that are prevalent all the time because each person's different. Well, do you have anything else you would like to say to your readers who will be reading this book, Developing Your Supernatural Awareness? I hope that it's very helpful to everybody because at the end of each chapter, I have exor little exercises that can enhance the experience for them. I've added that. And there's the stories are in detail, so you can really see the experiences. All right. Where can people read Developing Your Supernatural Awareness? They could get it at any bookstore. It's going to be released at the end of March. And so it, it'll be like Amazon will be sending out the uh, books on April 1st. April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah, so it's no, no big thing. deal. Right, right. Anything else we should know about this book or about your work? Well, just that I did the best I could to share the knowledge that I had with people and hope that, you know, people get something out of it. It was the truth. It was what I saw from the experiences that were shared with me. And that's, you know, what I provided. Do you have a website that you would like us to talk about? I have a website. It's Woodard Hypnosis and Psychotherapy.org. And Psychotherapy.org. Great. That link will be in the show notes so everybody can connect with you if they would like to share their supernatural experiences. Are you taking clients now? Yes, some, not a ton, but a few. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. And mostly in the New Hampshire area. Can you do this online? I don't do it online. I do it in person. Good. Good to know. Fantastic. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I hope everybody will go out and read this book. It is very, very interesting. Don't know what to watch next? Decisions, decisions. Well, we've got some suggestions. You can click this little video here and watch that. It's something that we think you're going to like. If you like the last one, you're going to like that one too. You can also click on the subscribe button. And if you do that, then you'll get notifications whenever we have a new video up. Win-win, right? <laughs>